the angle is always slightly unflattering. It's like low, like a low angle. Yeah, you know, you, you got to do what you got to do, you know. All right, There's I think we're cat. now live. Oh, very good. What's your cat's name? <laughs> we're live. Tilly the cat. Tilly, Tilly the right. cat. So they were interviewing Dave Chisholm and Tilly the cat about his new record That's right. That's right. Uh, coming out in May called Instrumental. Um, so for people that don't know you, Dave, can you give us a couple minute overview of who you are and what you're up to? My name is Dave Chisholm. I am a tr jazz trumpet player and composer. I live in Rochester, New York. And um, and this project, it, it Instrumental, is my most recent release. Uh, it's a pretty like big project. Um, I also draw comic books for a living. That's another part. Like I just freelance in all kinds of different directions. And and so Instrumental is a combination of these two worlds. It's a it's a big like graphic novel, 224-page uh, book, and then it has a full-length music soundtrack. Uh, and each each piece of the multimedia project can stand alone and, and be like successful, but also when they're combined, I think it's really special. So, uh, yeah, and I I live in Rochester. I went to Eastman, um, just like you did, Nick, and uh, I have my doctorate in jazz trumpet from Eastman. And I stayed here after I graduated because um, I had a few good teaching opportunities and it's a pretty affordable place to live. And it kind of gave me the opportunities to kind of like explore um, like being an artist and all that stuff, you know? So mm -hmm. yeah, totally. Yeah. That's basically where I am right now. Nice. So, and you grew up where in Utah? Well, I, I, I grew up in Salt Lake city, Utah. I got my first two degrees from the university of Utah. Okay. And uh, I was actually born in Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I also lived in Minnesota for a while. So only places with like a lot of snow or a lot of cold. That's basically my, uh, you know, if I, if I just keep moving north, you know, keep going north and north. And, you know, I'll yeah. probably end up in like Finland or something like that. <laughs> so how long? I know. So you've been playing jazz and trumpet for a long time but so when did kind of the drawing and the graphic novel stuff kind of come into play in your life um it's always been a huge passion of mine um i grew up just surrounded by comic books and i and i started drawing like before i can remember um and uh in terms of like taking it seriously at all it was right around the year 2000 seven maybe like 10 years ago like i i, I did it like a, a lot in high school i was like that nerdy kid that drew comics and played jazz music and stuff you know mm -hmm. um and i then and then when i got my bachelor's degree i i didn't really draw much then and after i finished my bachelor's degree i toured with a rock band for two years um playing like piano and doing songwriting and stuff and after that broke up i really just felt like i needed another outlet um because i was really frustrated with music so i started drawing comics again and I self-published a book called let's go to Utah um it's like a road trip gone wrong story and um that book actually managed to get gain some traction in like weird indie comic circles and I sold quite a few copies of it mm -hmm. and um to get some like higher profile published work through dark horse comics and then that led to some other you know, other published work uh, through like a, a, co a company based in Philadelphia called Locust Moon. And um, yeah, I mean, and in that span of time, I started, I went back to school to get my master's degree and, you know, just kind of burning the candle on both ends, I guess, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I'm also curious, so you've always been kind of doing that. So what, what kind of drew you into playing you know, jazz and improvised music? Gosh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I will start by saying that the, in the same way that comics were always around when I was a kid, so was jazz music. Um, my dad, the earliest music I remember hearing um, <laughs> was, was my dad listening to Sketches of Spain and uh, like Let My Children Hear Music by Charles Mingus. Yeah. 
Um, wow. And Mingus moves by Charles Mingus. Like a lot. Of, my dad like loves Mingus, and um, and then also like the Beatles and Pink Floyd, and then like MTV. Like so, there's a lot of rock rock and pop, but also like a lot of you know really classic iconic jazz music. Um, not to say that I was like really like listening on an intellectual level, but I think some of it like kind of like sunk in slowly and just kind of lingered around. And then when it came time to start playing music or to, to like to pick your band instrument, um, I chose trumpet because my brother played trombone. Okay. And he's like, you know, taller, he's like the tall guy and I was the short kid. And so I played the trumpet and, um, and yeah, you know, like with as far as jazz goes, I mean, it seemed like the cool thing, like all like the all of my friends played in jazz band in high school, and um, my brother was in all state, so I went to like a little clinic and everything, and there was this educator, uh, who was it? It wasn't Fred Sturm. He was the near. I was in all state. He was the okay. guest director, which is kind mm -hmm. of cool. Um, but it was um some guy from LSU, I think. And he said, like, oh, you can just learn solos off of albums. And I know that, like, at this point in time, like, any high schooler who is serious about music should know this. But, like, this was at a time when, like, it was before the internet was the big thing. And, like, I just like playing trumpet. I just was like, playing trumpet. And so, and so I was like, oh, cool. So I went back to the hotel room and, like, put on this Winton Marsalis album that I really liked and just started playing along with it. And realized in my like unsophisticated way, my totally intuitive way that I could like kind of fake, fake it. At the, at the time I thought I was faking it well, but I'm sure that if I went back in time, I probably sounded like total garbage <laughs> confidence to like keep blazing the trail forward and practicing and practicing more and more, you know, to have that little breakthrough. I remember the moment so clearly. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, so then it was sort of like putting together bands and always like trying to write new music. And I, you know, um, I got it really into like 1970s Miles Davis. My trajectory through jazz was really weird. I started with like um, a lot of like avant-garde kind of strange stuff. And then I sort of found my way back into like straight ahead, straight ahead jazz. So it was a pretty backwards route through like the first like band that I put together did like stuff that was almost exclusively like inspired by 1970s Miles Davis or like Masada by John Zorn, you know, Okay, yeah. <laughs> like somewhere between those two, wow. you know? Um, and in Salt Lake at the time, there was this, there was a really percolating avant-garde scene. Um, I don't know. There's a band from out there uh, called Iceburn that was kind of like a big, like sort of like odd time improvised, like rock textures, but like a lot of imp free improvisation. They would have like two saxophone players, two drummers, and like two guitar players and a bass player. And it was this really noisy thing. And um, they they played around, they played all over the place. I think they had, again, like some amount of success, as much as as much success as you could possibly have playing, um, you know, um, extremely challenging music. But yeah, right. so... And then, you know, in school, like, then it was, like, learning about big band music and kind of getting into, like, like, Gil Evans stuff and really falling in love with all that stuff again. And it's and it always has, like, a real big nostalgia kick for me to hear those Miles Davis, Gil Evans records just because of my early memories, like, when I was, like, three years old hearing Sketches of Spain. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> anyway, um... You know, in terms of the process, I think jazz improvisation is such a, um, it's like an old, it's like such a great tool for like learning about musical structure, mm -hmm. as you know, and, and it's also like a, a really interesting um, to think about it and compare it with other art forms in terms of the process, because with jazz improvisation, like, or improvisation in general, like your, the process itself is the art form instead of like almost like when you're talking about process, it's stuff that happens behind closed doors. Right. And then when you, you know, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's, I would say that's like, that statement is maybe like 80% true. I mean, there's like 20% of jazz improvisation where you really are behind closed doors, like working stuff out, learning everything in like 12 keys 
and everything. But anyway, I'm no, I mean, I agree. With you. No, I agree with you because the main draw of a main draw, I think, to jazz music and that's something that I think is important to talk talk to people about is that fact that they're going to experience the only one, maybe one of the only times that they'll experience like seeing artists create in the moment as opposed to going and appreciating paintings by dead people. Right, 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 so. right, right. Um, yeah, so, so, I mean. So to I, me, this draws I, an inter interesting question, like how do you draw those two things together with the music and, and the art, the drawing, the comic stuff together, like knowing that you could theoretically, you know, read, go and do a live performance of the music, uh, but still wanting it to relate to this thing that's kind of more set in stone that you, you also created. Right, right. Um, I think like, uh, you know, I, I would say like as a, the, the music on instrumental on this album, like, the, mm, it's, it's like pretty structured, I think. Um, definitely, like, I improvise a fair amount on it. Aaron, the drummer, improvises a fair amount on it. Um, Mike, the piano player, has a little bit of improvisation on it, and he's like does some accompanying. But really, like, this are pretty much like locked in to like specific, specific parts, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and in terms of like road, like there's a there's a road map where I mean it's pretty typical, I guess, with like modern jazz, like small group jazz music, where you know the charts are pretty big, and then there's one section that is like the improvisation section, and then everything else is pretty much like structured out. Um, so finding that balance, I mean, when it when it comes time for like the live show, as much about the art in the the art like the visual art in the book um even like <clears throat> when i'm talking when you're looking at the music that's on the album versus what what's in the book i think it's for the most part like um like a mood enhancing thing it's not a specific one-to-one -one ratio mm -hmm. like there's no like turn the page when you hear this tone you know kind of right. thing right but there are some moments in the book that i definitely am trying to capture in the music like the first time the main character Tom plays the horn, like I want to capture that moment, um, like towards the end of the first track, right? The first time he plays this mysterious doom horn, like like I like it's I wanted to capture that moment, or um, like in the second chapter when his band plays and. There's this weird time thing, this weird space time thing that happens where like the art gets all weird and trippy and strange. And it turns out that they just played for four hours, right? That's like the thing. They they play, they finish their song. And um, who's modeled after Alexa Tarantino? Right? <laughs> okay. Um, looks at her phone and is like, oh my God, we just played for four hours. And there's something about the second track. I tried to like mess with time on that second track, sort of like the way time is treated on that second track. And it's like a, you know, it's a loose relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I think it's more like, like building a vibe for the, for the book. Um, that doesn't mean that the music is only just vibe building though. Cause there's a lot of like interconnected stuff in the music on this album. There's a lot of like, like, like heavy compositional um, ideas that I'm really trying to work out over the course of it. So, you know, um, I hope that's a good answer anyway. <laughs> no, no, it's just a good answer. So do you think, do you feel like the, it, you're talking about the composition and co the way you were or organizing it. Is it kind of like one long piece that's like broken up into movements or do you think, does it feel like separate pieces to you? Hmm. I, I guess, I guess when I hear it, when I think about it, it's one piece. Mm -hmm. It's like one big piece, you know, um, there's enough, like, there's enough, um, recurring material over the course of the seven tracks to me that it's like, that it's one, like seven movement 
piece. Mm-hmm. Um, so w- yeah. how did you come up with the, with the idea to, to do this? I mean, this obviously you've been doing both for a long time. Oh man. But uh, not a lot of people yeah. are able to, you know, create a multimedia project where they do everything. Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think I stumbled upon a pretty, like on one hand, it was like an intuitive kind of like, oh, this would be a cool idea. Mm-hmm. Like moment where I was like doodling. You know, I have like a lot of friends who are like visual artists and and sometimes we all just hang out and like, we'll just like jam. It's like a jam session, but like visual art jam session where we just all draw and we all might even pick a topic and all like have like a little like jam on this topic or, um, and at one of these sessions, I drew like a picture of like a trumpet player and a drummer playing. And it was like really stylized. this really like inky stylized thing. And I was like, oh, I should do a book about a trumpet player kind of like riffing on like this Faust story where a trumpet player has a horn that kills people. And then I, so that, that like planted the seed. That was again around like 2008. That oh, was like a long time ago. And I just kind of like sat on it and ruminated on this subject and sort of like in any dead time, I would like sort of um, give it a little bit of thought and like, oh, what would, what would be like the arc of a story for like a, for like this, for this, like, what would, what would be the ramifications? Like, or why, why would the trumpet, like, what's the story behind this horn? Why, why does this, why is this like, is the main character a hero? Is he a jerk? is and then just sort of like piecing it together you know thinking about like um like why 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 would you keep playing a horn if bad things are happening like why would you keep playing it so then you need the element that like the music has to be totally killing when he plays his horn right Mm -hmm. then thinking about like well why like what's this guy's priorities if he's gonna sort of keep playing his music and happening and is he in denial about it? Is it obvious that he's causing these things? And sort of like all these problems sort of descended as I kind of had this idea. And just my brain, like, just kind of, I just was working it out, like, over several years, really, just kind of like, while I was working on my master's degree and my doctorate, I was just like working this out in my head. And, <laughs> and then like, the elements started coming together. And I kind of, as I was approaching the end of my DMA, I was thinking like, man, I really want to do this project. I really want to do this project. And in a, by, and definitely by that point, I was like, um, I did the, I did calligraphy. Um, I did the album calligraphy and um, I was really happy with that album. I think it turned out really cool. And I wanted to explore that space more. It's sort of like post rock meets jazz improvisation space. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of inspired by like Christian Scott stuff loosely with like having guitar and piano and then trumpet is kind of like the like lead singer or something like that. And so um, I knew I wanted to do a follow-up album to calligraphy mm-hmm. and um, I, and then it kind of like all came together in my head and was like, Oh, I should make this all one big project. And then when I was studying for like my comps test at Eastman, the big, 14 hour test at the end of the doctorate, I kind of came across all these figures in music history that were like, that like had some sort of weird, like spiritual or I don't know, occult like background, like Hildegard Mm -hmm. and like, you know, Scriabin. And then I, and I was like, oh, these characters are, these figures are so interesting and so cool. Like, I'll just put them in my story, right? So the main character, like, encounters Hildegard and Mozart at a party. He encounters John Coltrane in the middle of the book. And John Coltrane is the one that he actually recognizes and is like, how is this happening? This is impossible. He, then he encounters, towards the end, he encounters uh, Jim Morrison and Scriabin hanging out together, which is, like, a really random, you know... And it's sort of like they take on the roles of like an angel and a devil on his shoulders, like with like the dilemma towards the end of the book of like, 
do you keep following this path or do you like ditch this path of like possible possible destruction and everything like that and um to me when i found those pieces i was like oh this is it this is the last piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. and then like i um while i was studying for comps i sort of like mapped out these seven chapters and i kind of like titled each chapter that were like inspired by the titles and sort of started tweaking these pieces and then the day after I finished comps, the day after I took the test, I started working on the book. And that was in 2013. And I just started scripting, right? Like writing a movie script basically for this book and started composing the music. And some of the music was like as ad adapted versions of adapted songs that I had already written. Okay. So the second track, Celebration, to be performed at the Festival of New Trumpet Music in 2012, I think. So it's like okay. a pretty old piece of mm -hmm. mine. Um, but there were um, a couple of motives in that song that actually became really key for like the rest of the record. Like rhythmic, rhythmic devices, like four against three rhythms. And also like the melodic content of that is really similar to like the last track on the album. So, um, so yeah, anyway, it all kind of like fell together this in this organic way. And at that point in 2013, I was like really blessed to have like a lot of free time. Okay. Like yeah. Copious amounts of free time, which you obviously need to do something as stupid as this project. <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, so I would basically like was super regimented. I'd wake up at seven every day, seven days a week and work from 8 AM to noon on this. And then I would, eat lunch and maybe go to work for a little bit. Cause I had a job where I could kind of make my own hours. And then I would work from like the 5 PM to 9 PM. Wow. And just like really regimented, like work, 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 just obsessively work every day. And I finished the bulk of the work for this compose, composing, writing, drawing, scanning in like, um, by the end of that year, by the end of 2000, 13. So I okay. started it in February and I finished it in December and I look back on it and I have no idea how I did it. It was like really just insane. And at that point I had like had a publisher that was like interested in the book and they were like in dealing with publishing schedules is really like, like a, at least in the comic book industry is like pretty like long. It takes a long time for public stuff to come around. Right. Right. And when it came around, when it came around at that point, the publisher had hit some financial hardships. Right. And so they had to back out of it like at the last second. And I was totally oh, wow. really crushed and heartbroken about it. And then their finances came back and then it had to come back around again, which is why it's been sitting on un, uh, unseen for so long. And now it's finally coming out and I'm really excited and um, I can't wait. It's going to, I think people are going to love it. So yeah, that's amazing, man. That's that's so cool. You know, I, I think you kind of answered my my next question, but maybe I'll ask it anyway. I was kind sure. of wondering, um, I was kind of wondering how the processes of composing and writing kind of work either together or in parallel for you. Just kind of as you know, an artistic question because I'm just yeah. I think I think man, it seems to me like you kind of went back and forth, but uh, yeah. You know what? This is really there's this is a this is going to be a pretty big answer, actually. So sorry. No, it's okay. Um, Go ahead. The, the first thing is, actually, before this project, I had never been able to, like, maintain creative drive on, um, on music and comics at the same time, right? So, like, I had always been able to, like, write, be prolific as a musician, as a composer, or be prolific as a comic book like creator. And this is the first time where I really like went full tilt on both of these. And I'm, and um, so, so, so balancing these is tricky, right? As far as this project goes, it was really just a matter of time management and really just um, getting into a groove where like, you know that you don't need to wait for like lightning to strike. Right. Right. Um, 
I like to tell them, like any students that I have who are like songwriting students or composition students is like lightning strike once in a project, but it's your job to kind of like build from that. You have to use your own ingenuity to build from that lightning strike. And so um, I had to be like, be able to like sit down and work and be productive, like, without having to like rely on divine inspiration to kind of like come down and like help me out. Mm -hmm. Um, And each part of the process is a little different, like writing the script. um, Well, okay. So with composition, it's the same thing. Like, I suppose like this is, this is the part where you kind of like talk about the, equal how how a comic book and an album are really similar right like a graphic novel and an album so like an album ideally like to me is one piece one giant piece of music right like you want an album to be able to to stand as like one continue one arc right when you put out your album you think about track listing so hard because you want it to have this nice sense of like shape to the whole album as one thing right Mm-hmm. Agreed. And and with a story, it's the same thing. You have this one shape, one shape, one composition. You could say, okay. And then when you go to the when you go to each track, though, it has to stand alone. So each, then you have all of these standalone compositions, right? Um, where they don't suffer so much when they're like in the when they're taken out of the hole, right? And when you're dealing with a comic, each chapter becomes that standalone composition. Each chapter has to be somewhat satisfying in and of itself, right? Um, and then when you when you look at a track, like every each track is composed of like a few different elements, right? So you have maybe have like an introduction, and then a, you have might have a solo or two, and then you have an interlude, then you have that the, the the melody comes back, but it's a little bit different. And then you, so each one of these has its own little shape that should be satisfying as well, right? Um, and with co- with the, which each with each chapter in a comic book, e- um, each scene is maybe three to five pages long, and each one of those scenes has to be satisfying in a way. Like each one of those has its own special composition, right? And then when you get down to the nitty gritty in music, like each phrase needs that you play, that you improvise needs to have its own satisfying shape in some way. That's the goal, right? You want each phrase to be like something that like, like almost has the his, everything built into that one phrase. It's a lot of pressure to put on yourself, you know, whatever. But like you want each phrase to be like meaningful. Mm-hmm. And then with comics, like each, each page, each page needs to be, needs to have a focal point. It needs to be satisfying when you, look just look at one page it should be satisfying in some sort of aesthetic way and you know then like each note right and then you get to each panel each brush stroke each like every single element needs to like be able to have integrity and um so this is kind of like equating these two kind of seemingly different art forms so like music um is like a series of nested compositions right nested like uh gestures and then comics is the same thing for me at least the way that's like the way my brain works through it in that process um Mm -hmm. so it's a little bit of a heady answer when you're talking about like the funny thing about music and comics is they're both like low art forms that or or art forms that have like humble beginnings you know what i mean like that were not like they didn't start out as like high art and then i think over the course of the 20th century um, both of them achieved, for better or worse, the status of high art. Yeah, right. Um, mm-hmm. And now they're both taught in colleges. You know, you can you have Pulitzer Prize winners for both jazz music and for comic book art. Um, and and I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's fascinating to, to compare the two. No, the it two, is. That's uh, why. That's why I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, this great. is definitely stuff stuff I'm, I'm obsessed about uh so yeah man no that's that, that's great um so and it also feels to me like a pretty natural extension of the other records that you've already done i think is this you like your third or fourth this is my third album third album um but colossus 
the Colossus album maybe counts as kind of half like part of a fourth album. Right, and then that's a, that's a big band that. record, a big band, right? That's right. for people that don't know. Um, and yeah, because it just seems like like the music anyway is like a natural extension of the other records that you've already done. And to me, uh, kind of relates to not only what you were saying Christian Scott, but maybe some of Dave Douglas in there too. Yeah, definitely, man. He's like, he's definitely one of my biggest influences, one of my heroes. I really just appreciate his commitment to like perpetual productivity. And he's always exploring new ways of presenting. Uh, he does a lot. He's also done a lot of multimedia work projects as well mm -hmm. with the silent film stuff. Um, and some other things I'm sure that I've, that I'm forgetting. Um, yeah. Like I love, I love that, that dude's work. He's amazing. For sure. And uh, do you, do you feel like uh, sharing that, that quote that he just gave you just yeah recently. yeah this is kind of cool um so yeah so dave and i it was really random like i would post like on this is how we kind of started communicating i would post on twitter um dream bands like fake band names of like some sort of some like just stupid jokes you know like acd2 where it's an ACDC cover band where they're all wearing Star Wars outfits or something like that. I actually think that might be a real band. <laughs> um, and he emailed me some good, some more examples of these, because I guess he didn't want to post them on Twitter, but he thought it was funny enough to reach out to me to email me. Mm -hmm. And then we had been in touch and like, um, I met him in person in Italy at the um Umbria Jazz Fest when I played out there with, Ryan Truesdell. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, and then like a month after we got back from that, I, uh, I played at the festival of new trumpet music, which is of course the organization that Dave started. Um, and that was awesome. And it was so, so, so he's like gone out of his way to, I feel like show me some support. And so anyway, I, I emailed him and just, I sent him the book and the album and was like, would, I would love to know what you think of this. And he dug it. And then I said, well, would you be interested in providing a quote for the, for the back of the book? Uh -huh. um, so let me, let me find it here. I just, I had it up for a second ago and I, since uh, bum, bum, bum. this is, he says enthralling Dave Chisholm is not only a wonderful trumpet player and composer. He's also a compelling storyteller and graphic artist who has put together a strange and gorgeous tale with instrumental, a gripping read. So that's cool. I'm pretty yeah. stoked about that. It's like definitely makes me feel like oh, I'm doing something, doing something right. You know, so that's good. Yeah, man, you're going for it, which is most people won't even get started with a project that's this large in scope and scale. And you've, you know, it took yeah, a long time. Really, but you... It's really, uh, it's really crazy, man. Like, um, you know, the, the common wisdom in comics is haven't, if you don't have anything major published, you should only be doing small projects. Okay. And um, cause it's really hard to find a publisher for something this, this kind of like outrageous, like a bit, it's pretty long. It's like 224 pages and um, it's a pretty expensive project. And so I'm, I just want to also give a shout out to like uh, Josh Frankel um, he's the publisher for Z2 Comics, and they're putting the book out. They're taking a risk on the, on this project, and so I hope that um, <laughs> I hope it pays off for them too. I hope I hope everybody feels like it was worth the investment, um, because because uh, yeah, I mean I put everything I have into this project for sure. It like I feel like I feel like that period of time after I finish it, and nothing, and where like. That it kind of fell through for a second. I was just so crushed, you know, it just killed me. It yeah. just killed me. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, man. But it's just a couple of weeks away, right? What's the uh, official launch date for the book? I, I think if you're ordered it through a comic shop, the direct market is a little earlier. It's like May 10th. Okay. If you order it on Amazon, it's May 23rd. Mm -hmm. And then the album comes out May 26th. I have that. I know that. The album comes out on, That's right. on Friday, May 26th. It's 26th. We got the calendar right here. 
So all of that uh, kind of coming together. So how does the, remind me of the packaging. So if people want to buy the book and the music, what's the best way for them to support you and to support the comic book company? Well, I think, um, I think that the book is going to come with, it's going to just basically have like a link in the book or a QR code to like um, a place where people can access the music. I mm -hmm. think it's going to be downloadable, but honestly at this point, it's not, that aspect of it, like I'm leaving that up to those guys. Like gotcha. they, I know that Josh has a plan for it. And so I trust that his, that he has that figured out. Um, but it'll be on all the streaming platforms like that you right. would expect. Like it'll be on Spotify. It'll be on Apple music. And, um, and then, it, and then we also have it available on CD for all those people who want, like who like physical media media. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, this is what I'll be selling at my concerts and shows and stuff like that. But, but so, so, so talk about that a little bit. Do you have uh, some some shows coming up where people can find you and the book and the music? Yeah, well, on my next show for this music, actually, this is I'm just putting this together right now, and it's just at like a little place here in Rochester called Joe Bean Coffee. They've been doing jazz concerts every Thursday night there, and <laughs> I booked a date in june on thursday june 15th and so um if anybody in the rochester area wants to hear some of this music played live mm -hmm. uh we're playing at joe bean on june 15th and it's and it should be it's a good band it'll be really fun um unfortunately the people on the album all live in different places around the world now so like my like the piano player mike lives in denver colorado or Greeley, colorado ben the bass, bass player lives in germany now i think mm -hmm. Yeah, he's um, in Germany. Yeah. Noah Noah lives in Brooklyn, and the drummer and me still live here in Rochester. So Aaron's on the gig. It's a different bass player. Cool. Dave Klug on bass. Matt Curley's gonna play keyboards on it, and then um, I'm adding uh, Colin Gordon, like one of my best friends, Colin Gordon on alto saxophone, um, just because mainly just because I love his playing, kind of adjust the music so that it's um there can be two horns on it sure. and then um we're also going to play the music from calligraphy from the previous record too so should be fun man yeah that's great and I'm, plan and I'm planning on booking more shows around here um i'm not sure how much touring i'm going to be able to book mm -hmm. uh i admire nick i really admire your like total ambition and booking the tours man you're like on the next level it's like so awesome it's so cool man and uh that's like like you like talking about the commitment it takes to do a project as big and ridiculous as like instrumental like to me booking a national tour is like a zillion times harder than thinking about than booking trying to than trying to draw like a 200 page comic book so you know it's just well, there's each, a lot of other people you're relying on i guess each, yeah man it just seems like and just to see it all see like pull it off with such like flair and and it seems like it's it's i don't know it's just really cool man i really admire it so um so kudos well, i'm sure to you, you man. I really i'm sure you it. have the uh the attention to that longevity that that would, would take for you to do it too but uh but yeah this uh -huh. is super cool Wait, and I so, hope so okay this is a, this is unrelated to like the interview but when do you start, how far in advance do you start booking something like that? Like, is it like six months in advance? Is it? Well, a lot of different venues have a different, um, you know, time span that they book in. But I, I started booking the tour for this. The tour was basically most of February and half of March and, and then another leg this last week. But I started, um, we recorded in mid-June of last year. And then we started, I started booking the week after we finished recording and mm. kind of kept on booking stuff up until february in february i was booking this these april shows so some of it was really far out because yeah. there was a lot of um you know colleges and stuff like that so those kind of got booked first kind of farther out and then kind of filled in filled in things as we went awesome man awesome that's so cool well I got to reach out to some colleges. That's, that's what I need to do. That's the next thing for me to do. I got to reach out. Yeah, man. I mean, it's super cool. I mean, this, 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 this will be yeah. a great calling card. I think, you know, you have this, 
this big project and right you know it's not not everybody's doing something that's as yeah. ambitious because i've also taught comics at like comic book yeah anyway anyway that's unrelated you know this is like obviously not within the confines of the no no it's great but, um, that's great um is there anything else that you want to <laughs> the cat is still there that's true tilly does she yeah. just sit there like all day on the heater yeah that's right that's funny um so is there anything else you wanted to, to share about about the about the album anything we didn't kind of touch on i think we i think we covered i think we covered it man um yeah yeah thanks for the thanks for the interview yeah of course thanks for getting together and be sure to what's what's uh, the best place for people to find your stuff online it's dave chisholm music.com uh and chisholm is spelled c-h-i-s-h-o-l-m it's that second h that throws people off you know yeah yeah um cool yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll put a link you know, in the description i'm on facebook like basically constantly <laughs> <laughs> and you're a pretty prolific tweeter i think right you got some on cnn or something oh. that's uh that's right. Yeah, that was a while ago. Um, yeah, I suppose if you want, I tend to like use Twitter as more of like a political outlet. So, so follow, um, follow with caution and unfollow freely. <laughs> um, That's funny. And yeah, you know, get retweeted like, like all like like 190 times. <laughs> so oh. that was cool. That's crazy. Politi political tweets. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, Dave, and uh, people will be sure to check out the record. So, um, yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Nick. Yeah, man. So we'll talk again soon, and congrats. Thanks, man. <laughs>